Hi, I'm Frederick Dunn, and for many years I've kept bees here in the northeastern United States where we endure extended winter periods. So in this segment, we're going to talk about how to get your honeybees through the long extended winters, whether it be heavy snow, rain, or cold weather. Thanks for watching. It is important to keep in mind that beekeeping is local. Overwintering practices will be different in places with different climates and weather conditions. It's a good idea to connect with local beekeepers to find specific overwintering practices for your area. This episode is based on temperate conditions. Well, it begins right off the bat with the kind of bees that you're keeping. The best bees are going to be those that are locally adapted already. So, for example, if you get honeybee swarms or if you collect feral colonies, and uh, possibly even source your bees from local beekeepers who already have had their bees get through several winters, you'll be way ahead. Some of the southern warm weather bees generally don't do well when it comes to getting through a long sustained winter, and that's because their natural biological reproductive rhythm may not match the environment that you're gonna keep your bees in. So how bees survive winter in cold climates depends largely upon, number one, the number of bees they have in the colony going into winter, their overall health, of course, and condition, and also how many resources they might have saved up for winter. And then after that, getting your hive equipment ready so that your bees have their best possible chance to get through winter. So we want to set up our hives first with a deep brood box in spring. So anytime that you have bees that are going to get through winter, they need to build up enough stores and we need enough bees. Why? Because the bees are going to be the insulation actually that gets your bees through winter, not so much the box itself. And by the box, I mean the beehive. In colder climates, you're going to usually need at least two, one deep box and one medium, or maybe two deeps because in the snowy climates, we might need 50 to 100 pounds of surplus honey to get those bees through winter. Because all of those months, five or six months out of the year, they won't be bringing in new resources, so they will depend completely upon what they've brought in and stored from spring to middle summer. If there's a dearth period, they even are challenged by that. And then the fall nectar flow is when they're gonna bring in the most resources and the foraging bees are gonna die off and then they're gonna produce nice fat winter bees that don't forage at all, but rather store fat and get heavy bodied so that they can generate heat inside that cluster and preserve the brood that are gonna sustain them into the following year. A strong colony is going to be indicated by a lot of bee activity on days when the sun is shining and the weather is clear and warm. Generally, if it's above 61 degrees Fahrenheit or 17 degrees Celsius, you can expect to see lots of bee activity when the colony is queen right, that means that she's laying eggs and there should be larvae being attended to inside that colony by the nurse bees. So how do we see the resources that are coming in for the bees that are developing the larvae? Well, we're gonna see lots of pollen coming in. And if you see at least, this is a general rule of thumb, if you see at least 10 or more foraging bees coming in with pollen on their hind legs within a minute, so every minute, 10 or more bees with pollen, generally your queen right, which means that you have a fertile queen who's actively laying. So if you wanna estimate the resources in your hive, you need to do uh, an inspection of it. We need to look at the brood size. You need to look at the workforce size. Because while the nurse bees are tending to the brood and feeding those larvae, uh, we need other bees that are gonna be guarding the hive. We need bees that are gonna be cleaning the hive and removing dead bees because bees are dying every single day, just as bees are hatching out every single day once winter breaks. So we need all of that going on at once and the larger forager force you can put out into the world, the more resources come back and then the cycle continues, the more nurse bees, the more brood and so on. So how do we estimate the resources? Well, just by physically looking at the spaces, a cluster going into winter time would be about the size of a soccer ball or even a basketball. So it would span several frames of brood. If you have a very tiny brood cluster, then they're gonna have a very difficult time getting themselves through winter because remember the bees themselves are gonna insulate and at the center of that cluster is where the brood will be maintained. Sometimes a very small pattern of brood going through winter. In some areas, they are never completely broodless, but the more brood that's present, the more energy they're going to need in order to keep that warm. The brood 
when it's present, is going to need to be from 94 to 97 degrees inside that cluster. So obviously, the more brood there is, the bigger the area, the more bees are going to be involved in heating the brood and preserving them. Therefore, the more honey and resources they're going to consume as a carbohydrate to give them the energy they need to generate the heat. Another way to estimate the resources is how much weight is on. So there are things like hive scales, but you can be much more basic than that. If there's a lot of honey that's stored in the hive, it's going to be very heavy. And as I said, a medium super might weigh about 47 pounds. So you can physically grab the handles and try to lift it. You know that it's heavy. Remember too that the honeybees themselves have weight. So a nice heavy hive, and if you don't want to lift it, because that might be bad on your back, you could try to tilt the hives just a little bit and you can feel the weight. In fact, you go down the line and this is where having several beehives at once would benefit you because you can make a comparison. This one seems a little heavy, good to go. This one seems a little light, might need help. So bees will survive winter based on those two things, food and the number of bees in the colony. So going into fall, we want to make sure in cold climates that they have maybe 50 to 100 pounds of capped honey inside the hive. The other thing about that is it's very important where those resources are located. In cold climates, bees are not very good at moving laterally into food resources. Instead, the cluster of bees, which can be about the size of a soccer ball or a basketball, will move vertical. So when they're using their own resources in wintertime, they're going to vertically move about one millimeter per day. So for example, if you know they're going to go a millimeter a day and you know they need to do that over five months, then it's the number of days times millimeters. And then you'll know if you need 16, 17 centimeters to get them through winter. So as we go into the fall, going into winter, the first order of business, of course, is to get your bees set up for winter. So first thing that happens is we want them to fill their brood box and we want that to be brewed. And we want the protein resource in the form of pollen stores. And then we want the outskirts of those frames to be full of honey, sometimes capped, sometimes uncapped, because it's very fluid. They're filling and consuming from those cells as they rear and attend to the brood. So then the next box up, which is a medium or even another deep, uh, that's the one that's going to be filled with nothing but honey this time of year because where's the brood going to stay concentrated? Down low near the entrance where they can vent the brood because they need to clear away the CO2 from the brood and they also need to control their temperature. So the honey stores start to get pushed up higher. So as we add boxes, second box just for the bees, third box, that could be looked at as a resource for the beekeeper and that's what we take off. So we always want to make sure that they're taken care of for winter as early on as possible and then any surplus after that we can reap the benefits from. You may not even take honey off of some of your colonies at the end of the year during your fall nectar flow and uh, that's because they may have never expanded beyond that deep box and the second box above that which is their winter survival resources. So once they have that survival resource built up, don't you dare take that off of them. If the structure and the hive is physically light, it might be time to make sure that you have a sugar syrup available for them if your area is not providing what they need. So if you open up your colony, you should see wall-to-wall -wall bees throughout that bottom box. So if every frame isn't full of bees, and if it's only 70% or 60% drawn comb and the rest of the frames are empty, whether that's an eight or a 10 frame, and it's not time to expand the box. You've got a small colony that isn't rapidly reproducing. And that's why you need to be able to assess colony strength. Look at the brood. If there's a bunch of capped brood, then we know that there's about to be an expanded workforce coming. And that's when we can start to put on those extra boxes. So as you get uh, prepared, let's say we've, we've gone through summer, we had a healthy buildup in spring, they had all the resources and food they need. Going into winter, now that we've done all of that, they've stored everything they can, they expanded, you had three, four boxes. Let's say you had a flow hive on there. And so we had a deep box, we had at least a medium, then we had a flow super on there or whatever other style of honey super you might've had. Once you've extracted honey from a flow super or from another type of honey frame, so once you've got that box done, you take it off. Now we'll take that box off, empty, cleaned by the bees, and we're gonna put that in storage for winter. So we need to protect it from mice 
Wax moths and things like that are not such a problem in the colder climates because they're not flying in winter. But we want to put, I use trash bags, but you want to put some layer between each box that prevents anything from migrating box to box. And we're going to put them in winter storage in a space that's unheated. That way we benefit from the cold air and the extreme temperatures that we have environmentally that are challenging the bees are also serving to preserve and destroy any remaining parasites that might be in any of those supers. So once we've removed those, we're packing down the boxes. And this is depending upon how many bees are in the boxes to begin with. So we know we've got the deep, you're not gonna get rid of that, that's an absolute minimum. And we want to have resources for them to eat, so we've got probably two boxes a deep and at least a medium super full of honey going into winter. All the other boxes have been removed and that's considered packing down the hive. Because the bees, although they do not heat the entire interior of your beehive, they do occupy the space and they need to police that space. And when they're in a cluster, when the cold weather's really hit and they go into a state of torpor, which is very near a state of hibernation, but their metabolism is very low, the cluster becomes very tight. The colder it is, the tighter the cluster, because remember that they're insulating themselves with the bodies of bees. There is some respiration coming from those bees. There is some ventilation coming from those bees. And that's why outside the cluster, we do get a slightly increased temperature inside the hive bodies. So if we have a lot of extra space for them to deal with, that actually provides more surface area inside the hive where condensation can build up, and that the bees would not be able to police and control. And then you've got areas too that the bees can't keep clean. So once they're condensed down and there's that cluster, now it's a manageable space for the bees. Whenever temperatures rise above 51 to 52 degrees Fahrenheit and they're in sunshine, southern exposure if you're in the northern hemisphere, then that warms part of the hive and the bees cluster loosens up a little bit and they actually start to move around and they can actually glean water and resources from that condensation. So they actually use some of the interior condensation to actually hydrate themselves because bees in winter need water just like we do. The other thing is going into winter, some of the ways that we help the bees is we can insulate the hive. The most critical insulated part of your hive will be the cover. And we've learned over the years that a top vent is not beneficial to the bees in the winter time because they're storing heat as the cluster moves up. Remember, at one millimeter per day, they're migrating up. So near the end of winter, you see the cluster of bees just under the inner cover. And that's also where hopefully you have some emergency feed, which we'll talk about in a minute. But once they're up there, they're keeping this area warm and they're keeping this area dry. So the condensation in that hive is going to be on the walls and at the dew area, where it hits the dew point, where there is moisture, where the warm air just hits that cold interface, and that's where the frost builds up. And that's where when we have a warm up, all of a sudden there's moisture dripping down the sides and the bees can benefit from that, but they can also be overwhelmed by it. So what happens is if you have an upper vent, that warm air exits the hive up there and it makes it more difficult for the bees to keep their cluster warm because what's happening in spring during this warm up period, they're also starting to expand the brood. And they can't do that unless they have enough bees to keep a large enough space for the queen to lay and for those eggs to be protected until they hatch and become larvae and then for the larvae to be fed and cared for in the shelter of the cluster. So this is why we vent at the landing board and along the bottom of the colony, because if they need to move more air through there, they can do that themselves. The bees will move the air, they'll circulate the new oxygen in there and get rid of the CO2, which is coming from the respiration of the bees themselves, and of course, the respiration of capped brood. So all of these things happen at once, and this is why ventilation at the bottom of the hive is much more critical than any kind of vent up near the top, which actually may work against the bees. The last thing we want is for them to have to deal with drafting and a loss of control of the thermal envelope that they have in there that they've worked so hard to preserve. The other thing is make sure that the hive that they're in going into winter, 
does not have leaks in it. it has a great preservation system on the outside in the form of paint or varnish or you could insulate it we also need to make sure that your colonies of bees are shielded from extreme temperatures so if rain's falling on the hive it needs to have an absolute waterproof roof we need to think about where the water is going to shed going down it where are the prevailing winds so you need to shelter also from the wind when snow falls around it and the snow builds up heavily around the beehives where I live, I find that that's actually a great benefit. It's not a negative for the hives. And when we look at the beehives in the middle of a heavy winter storm, and I go out there and I see that the snow is heaped up completely around the hive, you might panic and think when I look at that beehive, they must be suffocating. I have to clear the snow away from that hive. But please don't do that because actually the snow load is providing insulation. They're protected from wind. It's going to be about 32 degrees Fahrenheit up against the outside of the hive without wind and drafts. And before you run over there and start shoveling away the snow, it's a great opportunity to look at those hives carefully. So sneak up, look at the landing board, look at the main entrance, and what you'll find out is that the bees have maintained their own little cone of air traffic there. So they've created an open space and kept an open space and moved just enough air to keep up with the falling snow. So these little holes and these little vent pathways are developed and maintained as the snow falls. And the bees do that by moving their own warm air out through and then they use those same openings to draw the cool fresh air in as needed. And honeybees can manage with an extremely small amount of oxygen and a very low amount of air movement. So this is why it's very important not to open and inspect your beehives during these cold periods of winter because you could be the reason that they lose that very critical tiny amount of warmth that they worked so hard to preserve. Now, if there's no venting, or if you've got a warm-up coming and you think they may be needing to fly out, and remember that happens anytime they're above 51 degrees Fahrenheit, if the sun is hitting the hive, they may actually fly out earlier than that. And this is where you need to be really vigilant about clearing out the debris on the landing board and making sure that their entrance is not plugged with dead bees. That's their vent. It's also their exit point. Now, if you've got an entrance that's a little higher up off the landing board, you might wanna have something like that that you could open in an emergency on those warm days and then you see bees flying out there. But if their entrance is plugged with dead bodies, they're trapped and they actually may expire. So don't forget that you may also need to put up a mouse guard. But when you put a mouse guard in, which reduces the entrance for your bees in wintertime, that's an easier space for them to protect. Also, during wintertime, we need to know what our bees are doing. So you need to be able to look at and properly assess your colonies case by case to see where that cluster is located. We don't want to open up beehives while we're in the middle of winter because as soon as you do, if you pop the cover on a beehive and you expose them, you've just released all the warm air that they've saved in the upper parts of the box. And when you do that, you risk cooling the brood. So instead, what I do is we use thermal cameras and you get a thermal image of it. Some people use a stethoscope and actually listen to the side of the hive. Some people give a little tap and then the bees buzz their wings and exercise their muscles and make a noise so that you can hear them. And then you find out where the cluster is located, low or high in those boxes. In a perfect world, we wanna keep those bees down nice and low because what's that tell us? It tells us that they have plenty of honey stores still above them. And monitor their food through winter. If they're already up at the very top and they're right under that inner cover, this is where a feeding shim or a feeding resource at the top of your hive, completely enclosed under that cover, could save your colony. And for me, in the wintertime, the emergency resources that I put in there is just um, granulated sugar, dry sugar, nothing else. Some people refer to this as the mountain camp method if they just lay a piece of newsprint on top of the brood and then they put sugar on that and the bees can eat through the newsprint and access the sugar as they need. I don't personally like that method because it means you had to pull the cover off and access the brood and put the paper down and so you've risked exposing them to the cold. So I like to have the inner cover on and a feeder shim or something like that then you have the dry sugar available there and then the bees can get up in there, but it does not vent to the outside. 
And that's what we're avoiding. We don't want them to lose the critical heat. So another thing that we don't need to really be alarmed about once winter does hit is you're going to see a number of dead bees on the landing board. And then you're also going to see sometimes dead bees right in front of the colony, which is more rare, but that happens often when the first snows begin. And some of the bees attempt to fly out, but they end up landing in the snow and just expiring right there. So I'd much rather see a colony with some dead bees in the snow in front of it. That tells me that they're alive and trying to do cleansing flights, for example. Or that drones are being cast out because in areas where it gets cold through winter and they can't fly through winter, one of the first things they're going to discard will be the male bees. Now, some people often ask, do bees fly out? How do they go to the bathroom in wintertime? Well, during the most extreme periods of winter and the cold temperatures, they don't go to the bathroom at all. They don't eliminate at all. This is why when we have temperatures in the 20s and teens and all the snow is piled up around the hive, it can look like for all practical purposes that the hive is dead, but really they're in a tight cluster. They've lowered their activity. They're making no noise. And uh, they're also holding up to 30% of their waste material on board. 30% of their own body weight can be waste material on board in that cluster. This is why when the weather does break, when you do get the odd warm day when the sun hits the hive and the snow starts to melt and you see some bees flying out, you see little tan spots in the snow. And that's because as soon as they fly out, they're eliminating and that's called a cleansing flight. So when they fly out, they're doing two types of cleansing. One is they're removing themselves from the colony. If that particular bee is sick, it will fly out and not return to that hive. So it's also offered itself up to cleanse the hive, but also they don't eliminate inside the hive. Fly out, they would eliminate in the snow, and that's why you see the very second they've flown out, if it's been a long winter, right? Sometimes you see spatterings of brown on the landing board and on the front of the hive because they just can't hold it anymore. The second they fly out, they're doing that. It does not mean that your bees are suffering from any kind of dysentery. It just means they've been holding it 